Um, tonight I'm going to preach out of Genesis <laughs> chapter 11. If you want to get your Bible to Genesis chapter 11. Imagine a football player making a run for the end zone. And, and he gets, he's made a, it's a, he's going to win the game if he gets across the finish line, I mean across the end zone. And he runs up there and, and uh, nobody's around him. He's got her made. And he gets up on the one yard line and stops. Imagine what that'd be like. Wouldn't that be horrible? I mean, you just, why did he stop on the one yard line? I mean, you won the game. Um, have you ever heard of the term senioritis? <laughs> senioritis? That's what happens when you, uh, uh, like you're a senior in high school or college, uh, or, or uh, you're getting ready to retire, or you know, you're about to finish a major part of your life, and you kind of coast. You know, you got senioritis. You're, you know, you just phone it in, you show up, but your, your heart's not really in it because you're about to go on to a new chapter of your life. Uh, tonight I'm going to preach on uh, stopping short. Stopping short is the name of my message tonight out of Genesis 11. And uh, we're going to deal with some of the situations here because that's going to be part of tonight what we, what we study. And I want to encourage you not to stop short. Uh, keep going. Uh, you know, a lot of folks uh, have worked hard all their life, lived for the Lord, raised families, been good people, and they get down near the end of their life and they kind of go neutral. They kind of put it in, in, in uh, couch gear, you know, and, uh, and kind of settle in and, and kind of let it coast out. Listen very, very, very carefully. If God wanted you home, He'd take you there. Amen. Uh, all right? He's got no trouble doing that. But if you're here, there's a reason. And if you're here, don't quit running till you get home. Amen. Don't stop before the yard. You get into that. Okay, now let's pick up and see if we can make some sense of this. As one family, we find Noah getting off the boat. One family, unified, communicating well. They, they speak, they understand each other. They're, they're, they're all of one mind. One heart, they get off the boat. Uh, it says in, in uh, chapter 11, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. So everybody that got off the ark spoke the same language. They were unified. They, they shared common goals. They had the same mission. God had told all of them you know, to go into the world, repopulate, and all those things. Now, as they get off the boat, the memory of the near extinction is really fresh in their minds. It's made a huge impression on those people. We almost died. Everybody almost died. I mean, this thing came that close to being wiped out. No human race. It got that close. And so they get off the boat and they have this, this shared ex experience. And as it says in verse 2, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They settled down in Shinar. Now, we're going to, one of the most famous Old Testament areas is the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. This is referred to as Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia translated means between the rivers. That's what that word means. So they, if you were a world history class in high school or college, and you heard people talk about the cradle of civilization, you ever heard that term? Well, that's where this is. That's Mesopotamia. It's between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. So much of the Old Testament originates there because that was the cradle of civilization. It was at this place that human beings stopped being hunter-gatherers and started being farmers and ranchers. That's when we got off the ark, when we started over, that things were totally different about how we, how we fed our families, how we took care of ourselves. And uh, this is where it all started. Now, they learned to make bricks here in Shinar, uh, just very just up from the Dead Sea. They learned how to make bricks. Uh, they cemented them together with raw petroleum. Now, ladies and gentlemen, where are some of the largest oil deposits in the world? Does anybody know where that is? Right here, Mesopotamia. Uh, this is we're we're using that oil right now today. In my gas tank, in my truck sat in the parking lot, is oil probably mined right here in that area, in, the, in that, uh, in that uh, area that we've, we're talking about tonight. 
So the, the raw, raw petroleum in that time was bubbling to the surface. Surface, and uh, they would use that raw petroleum in a very crude, very sticky. Uh, if you leave it set out, it kind of make a, a hard, uh, it, it dry hard. Well, they would put that on their bricks that they made, and they made a very strong structures. Uh, this is where uh, we we see this happen. Now, why were they so excited about building very strong structures? Think about it a minute. Why were they so excited about big, strong structures? Because the world had just been flooded. They came that close to extinction. And these people are scared. They don't want to die out, so they're doing everything they can. And so they find this new building material, uh, bricks that they made, and they put it together, and they're, they're beginning to, to fight back against it, the near extinction that they went through. They said in verse 3, uh, they said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Now that's, as I said, they, they were scared. <clears throat> Their God had told them, <clears throat> when you get off the boat, you have to go around the whole world, repopulate it, and, uh, and that's what they were doing. But the, the idea of being alone, I mean separated from each other, was not appealing to them. They wanted to stay together when they got off the ark. Fear, I don't know, I don't understand it, but they did not want to go all over the planet like God told them to do. They wanted to stay in Mesopotamia. They wanted to stay right there where it was safe and comfortable. They understood how to live there. They knew how to raise their crops there. And they wanted to stay there. So they began to, to build a legacy. They wanted to build a legacy. And they started building out of this bricks and, and uh, mortar, this tar mortar, they started building ziggurats. You, ever, you know what a ziggurat is? We well, buy them in a pack and smoke them. That's not a ziggurat. They're the pyramids. Have you ever heard of a pyramid? Of ours. Well, guess where we're talking about? This is all starting right there. They're building these pyramids. They call them, archaeologists call them ziggurats. And they're all over the, the Mesopotamian area. All right, that's where this all kind of starts. Uh, you could see these ziggurats or pyramids from a long way off. Uh, they stood up. It, it was like they were afraid to get away from each other. And so they would build these great towers so that they could always turn and see where that tower was so they could get back together. In other words, it was a, a drawing net. It, it made them cohesive. It kept them together. Uh, as they, It was a beacon. Now, I don't think that they actually were building these ziggurats or pyramids to get into heaven. I, you know, I think, I think the Genesis says here, uh, because it says it reaches into heavens, I think it just means it reaches up real high, up into the sky, so they could see each other. But let's read it. You form your own opinion. Verse 4. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. All right, so let's stay together. Let's build towers. Let's, let's, because we don't want to get spread out all over the, the whole earth. So that was what they were trying to do. Now, if you are, with, if you are aware of this, and I think you are, um, this next statement here is absolutely so true. Let's just read it and I want to talk about it. Then they said, come... Let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may we make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the whole face of the earth. Now, what I want to say about this is human potential is unlimited. Now, let me say it again. Our human potential is literally unlimited. There isn't anything human beings cannot accomplish with good communication and clear goals, unity, you see, when they got off the ark, they had clear goals. They had good communication. They were all together. Everybody had one purpose. I mean, they wanted to stay together. Even though God told them to scatter, they had a, they had a mission. I mean, they wanted to build these ziggurats, live in these cities. That was their plan. And, and because they were so close together and they communicated so well, folks, they could have done about anything they wanted to do. Do you realize that in 60 short years we went from Kitty Hawk 
to walk where the first man flew to walking on the moon in 60 short years. Now, if if human beings, we, we are we're we're capable of a lot of <coughs> stuff, intelligent. And if we can ever get unified and get communication like we had, listen, things are going to be amazing. So here we find these people, and they were they were doing all these great things. So they wanted to they stay, to get together. So we're going to notice that the Lord is going to come down and He's going to mess up their communication. They're still going to be unified for a little while. But now they're not going to be able to communicate. Alright, let's read about it. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. They're going to do anything they want to do. They can, I mean, literally, can, nothing can, is outside the box. So come, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. <clears throat> Have you ever been in a foreign country or been around a, a, a someone who spoke a language that wasn't your mother tongue? Uh, many of us, you know, we're all more familiar with that as, as our populations begin to mix. Uh, and... Uh, to me, whenever I was a, when I was young, and I would hear a, a speaker in another language, it just sounded like they were saying blah 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 blah, right? Are you getting what I'm saying? They were babbling, babble, babble. That's important. The word babble is an onomatopoeia. You learned that in school. Onomatopoeia. It's a word that had, that sounds. I can't give you the definition, but it sounds like what it's trying to show you. It's babble, babble, babble. All right, so they were, whenever one would speak one language and God confounded their language, they would listen to him. They said, "Well, he's just babbling." Okay, I want you to get that because you're going to get, you're going to see how that all connects now to this Tower of Babel. You with me? All right, let's keep going. Now. So the Lord scattered them uh, there from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, so I guess I want to say then that that's what God did. He, he wanted them to go to the, to the north and to the south. He wanted them to populate Europe and Asia and China and Russia and, and then all. They wanted them to go all over the world and, and populate the world. And they wanted to stay together. So, what did he do? He caused them to fail to communicate. Oh. Has anybody ever had trouble with the person you're married to because you have a failure to communicate? I tell my wife, I said, honey. We've been married so long, you surely can read my mind by now. She says, I can, but use your words. Use your words. Pray for me, I live a hard life. Right. <laughs> so now we're going to see how important communication is. And I'll have more to say about that later. From In verse 10 through verse 26, is a long lineage. Alright? I'm not going to read it. You can read it tonight when you get home. It's just some he begot this guy and he begat that and he begat that. You know, it's a lineage, a family tree of the people from from Noah to Abraham. Now that's what we're going that's the connection. We're going to get now from the next chapter from Noah to Abraham and how that all connected, who was the granddad and who was the, the grandson and etc. That's what that's all about. We're going to move down to verse 27 now. And pick up there. This is the account of Terah's family line. The reason Terah is important is because he had Terah became the father of Abraham. And that's the next part of our study. Um, let's just read it. Verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive. Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees in the land of his birth. Alright. So here we have this connection. All these famous people we know about. Abram and Lot. By the way, we are now Abr Abram's name at this point in the study is Abram. A-B-R-A-M. It lacks the H. 
How do you pronounce an H? It's breath. So when you get to the point where you find the H in Abram's name, there is the breath of God in it. With me? That's where the H comes in. And before that, it's Abram. And but later we're going to call him Abraham. All right. Just what you want. To, so you know that, and you'll. So when that begins to happen, you're going to see that God's breath is breathing into Abraham's life. Okay. Now let's pick this up and, and see what we can find. Let's let's talk about Abram's wife and his brother's wife. Verse 29. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. By the way. By the way. Now she's Sarai. Later she's going to be Sarah. Uh-huh. Get it? Yeah. She's going to be Sarah later. But now she's Sarah. Okay. Stay with us. There's, isn't this good? I mean, this, there's stuff just buried in this all the way through. Abram and Nahor both married. The, uh, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now, Abram's wife was barren. She didn't have children. She, uh, we don't know what. She was reproductively uh, unable to have children. We don't explain, didn't explain it. She just didn't have them. Uh, it says in verse 30, Now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. So we see here that we're going to now we're going to meet. Or we're beginning to get the situation. Here's Abram, and we've met his brother, and he's married, and, and then they've had this, they have a, we met his brother's wife, and they're going to have a child, the brother's going to die, and the boy's going to be sort of a, a surrogate son to Abram. And this surrogate son, his name is Lot. And he's going to be more than just a nephew. He's, he's really the son Abram never had. He couldn't have children, so he really connects to Lot. Now, we're going to say a lot of things about Lot in our study. And we, Lot kind of has a bad name to him because of some things that happened. But the Bible and tradition calls Lot a righteous man. I want you to get this. Lot was a... In fact, he's called Saint Lot in a lot of the ancient world today. But he was a very righteous man, as was Abram. Uh, so we find that, uh, that, that they, that's, that's the background. Now, an interesting little thing that you don't often pick up as you study this, and I want to bring it to you today, because Abram's father was named Terah, and he was the first to move toward Canaan. He started the journey that Abraham later completed. It's, see, I believe that the God of heaven came down to that family and he started speaking even to Terah. He said, Terah, I want you to come with me and we're going to make a promised land. Well, Terah started toward the promised land, but he didn't make it. He stopped short. Uh, and, and then, of course, later, Abram. Let's, let's read about it. Verse uh, 31. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of, it, of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan, the promised land. So they all set out together to go there. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Now, do you remember what I told you the title of my sermon is tonight? Stopping short. Not completing your mission. Not finishing what God has, has laid on your heart to do. Saying yes to God will start you on the greatest journey of your life. Saying yes to God. Uh, in every way, when God comes to you with a, a concept, a thought, a request, every time, the best thing you can do is say yes. It, because when you say yes, you begin to go down a journey, a new way of living, a new way of thinking, new insights, new destinations. Every time God beckons you to follow Him, let me say to you, please don't miss the opportunity. Because you're being invited to go on a great adventure anytime God speaks with you. Now God can accomplish His will with us or without us. Now you need to understand that. 
See, if we didn't have a cowboy church here, well, God would just get somebody else and put, bring him and put one there. In other words, if we didn't do what God wants to do, God would get somebody else to do it. And, and listen to me very carefully. If we ever stop doing God's will, He'll get somebody else to do it. Because He, he will get done what He wants to get done. Now, here's the, here's the neat part. You can be a part of it and get all the blessing, or you can stand around and watch it happen. Are you with me? Now, in your life, the same thing applies. God has a tremendous adventure planned for you. I don't care if you've got another week to live. God's got a tremendous adventure planned for you. And you can either get along with Him and, and do it and, and enjoy that adventure and see the, the benefit of what God wants to do, or you can stand back and watch somebody else do it. Because He's going to get it done. So, let me just briefly now, as we're about to bring this down, where does God want to take me? I want to think about that. Where does God want to take me? And where does God want to take you? Where does He want to go? He's got a journey for you, an adventure. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is He wants to take you to your full potential. He wants you to be everything He made you to be. See, He invested in you unique, a unique set of gifts, a unique set of interests, a unique set of, I don't know, whatever, the parts of you. He put them together just for you. There's nobody else on planet Earth like you. You're unique. You're one in, uh, one in six or seven billion. And even more than that, because there's never been anybody like you. You are made for a unique, specific mission. And God wants to take you there. Now, He wants to... You're going to get to your full potential if you if you go back and, and a, a, attach to your life the benefits and blessings that Noah had, he had unity, unity, and communication. Whenever you get your life unified with the Lord and you communicate openly and then the others that God wants to bring in with you in your adventure, in that unity and communication, you're going to reach your full potential. Now, if you are are kind of a caveman, a knuckle dragger, and you're not real good at communicating with your wife or your husband or your children, you probably need to work on communication. Let me show you how to, to be a better communicator. Immediately, I can show you just like that how to be a better communicator. You ready? How many mouths do you have? How many ears do you have? Okay, you're not getting it. <laughs> How many mouths do you have? One. How many ears do you have? Two. All right. So the way to be a better communicator is to listen. Now, I, I, I get tickled when sometimes I'm talking to people and uh, and I know they're not listening to what I'm saying. They're sitting there. They're quiet, but they're thinking about what they're going to say next. Mm-hmm. You know, go ahead and get your... Would you hurry up and get done so I can tell you what I'm... <laughs> okay, see, that's not listening. That's not listening. Listening is, is an act of selfishness, selflessness. If you listen, you are loving someone else. You're not, you know, you're, you're not loving yourself. Some people just love to hear themselves talk. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't want to be accused of that, but you know... <laughs> But we love to hear our own talk, and we and we just come to talk. But if you if you really love someone, give do them the honor of listening to them. You can literally listen to a better relationship with your husband and wife. You can listen to a better relationship. You can listen to a better relationship with your children and your grandchildren. Learn to listen. All right, and speak less. Okay, so that's what I want to say. Now the, the next thing is. God wants to take you to your potential, but He wants to take you past your disappointments and your failures. He wants to take you past it. And most of us in here uh, are, are not spring chickens. We've, there's a few young folks, but most of us have lived long enough to have had some disappointments and failures. But if we're not careful, we'll get stuck. We'll get stuck at a disappointment or a failure. And we can't get by it. We can't get around it. We can't get over it. We get stuck. And see, we find here that, that these people were disappointed. Sarah was barren. But she didn't get stuck there. She followed the Lord. She went with the Lord. 
and, and God worked, worked through it. Uh, uh, anyway, get past your failures and disappointments. <clears throat> now, God wants to take you to, to fullness in spite of barrenness. Uh, as I said, it, let's, let's take a, talk about Lot for just a moment. Here was Lot, and I said how God used nephew Lot. God brought him and, and used him and gave him to Abram for a blessing. Lot was that... Lot filled a need there. And, and some of you here in the room tonight have gaping needs. You've had losses. You've had disappointments. And if you'll watch, God will begin to bring people to your life to meet needs, to fill in emptiness. God will bring them in and, and watch for them and accept them and bless them. And He's going to move you to a lasting legacy. It's just like those people build those ziggurats and pyramids in the, in the Mesopotamia. God's going to help you have a lasting legacy. He, he wants you to be remembered. He wants your efforts to be celebrated for generations. He does. He wants your grandkids to, to look back at your life and say, Grandpa, he was good at this. Grandpa loved me. Grandpa listened to me. Grandpa loved Grandma, or, or etc. And you just, God wants to build a legacy to pass down through the generations. So here, you, here we go. You can complete your God-given assignment if you trust Him and if you'll obey. Just trust Him and obey. Now, I guess I want to stop by saying this. Don't stop in Haram. Okay? Don't stop in Haram. Hey, old man Terah could have had a, a name like Abraham if he had not stopped. But he stopped short of Canaan. Don't stop in Haram. Don't get senioritis. <laughs> Don't get close and then slow down. I, I know there's a great tendency to do that. But don't stop. Remember, if God was done with you, He would have already taken you home. So, if you're here, there's a pretty good indication He's got something for you to do. So don't stop in Iran. Don't stop. I mean, hit the ground running. Go home. When you get to heaven, I mean, be war plumb out. And uh, have all your, you know, you have all your energy used up. Don't, I mean, Give it all for the Lord. Don't go sliding in the home. Amen? All right. Let's, uh, let's stop there tonight. We'll pick up in Genesis next time. And uh, let's pray together.